you join us today on a very unassuming housing estate in southern England. Now, that doesn't sound very exciting, but this housing estate holds a small clue as to exactly what we're in search of today. Let's go and have a look. To me, looks like an old canal bridge. So this little bridge is one of the few remaining remnants of the Portsmouth and Arundel Canal. And it's a beautiful little bridge nestled away here in this housing estate. Now, this canal asks many questions that we're gonna ask on this journey. One of which is how it forced a train to travel by road on makeshift rails. That's one of the many questions we're gonna ask on today's journey. Portsmouth and Arundel Canal was set to become part of an ingenious canal system which would take a route inland away from the English Channel and carry freight along the south coast without facing many of the dangers the Channel posed during the Napoleonic Wars. So before we start our journey and we head west along the old abandoned canal, this is the exact starting point of the canal, an inlet from the River Arran. Now, there's not a lot left here, on this side at least, but if you come down here, there's something very interesting which we've just found. This is the first part of the canal and this is the spot that marks the first set of lock gates. We're just by the River Arran and this would have been the part, part of the inlet. So right in front of us now, and if I can hold the camera, Rebecca, sure hold the camera. right in front of us now is this uh, coin stone, corn stone, which I pronounce that. This would have formed the base of part of the lock gate. So you have to use your imagination, but this is the second set of gates for the first lock. So here would have housed the actual lock itself and turned in and out. And if you use your imagination again and look that way, right where the flood barrier is there would have been the first set of gates for this lock. So there's one of the clue here before we move on west along the canal as to its history and sort of the tangible evidence that it was here. Come this way and I'll show you. So it's obviously, this field has been ploughed up a thousand times of course, but all along here and all in the edge, you'll find a load of brick all churned up and cut up in bits and pieces. And of course, this is uh, no doubt brick that would have been used to form part of the lock. At least I think it would have been. So behind us is towpath drive, ahead of us is navigation drive. That's probably the only clues in this little area that you're actually following the alignment of the old canal. Although the housing estate to the left, if you have a look on Google Maps, does have a few hat tips to what was before. I think there's beam close, tiller close. Yep. Um, but a hundred yards ahead of us, just over here, is probably one of the biggest clues that we're on the canal alignment. So hidden under this uh, great mass of shrubbery is a 170 year old bridge. Um, let's go take a look. Oh, that's a great shot. It's just completely hidden, isn't it? So without the help of a few really good websites that we look at for our resources and making these videos, we've never found this, it's just, you know, even if you walk right past it, you'd really struggle to, to find this. So it's still here. It's still yeah. 170 years on, hidden by all the shrubbery, and perhaps the shrubbery is something that saved it from mm. demolition, who knows. But yeah, what a little treat this is. So, burned our bridge done. Let's carry on heading west. You just hit your head. Yeah, oh God, yeah. You always hit your head. I know, it was like a branch. I always hit my head on the branches. They're like the most... Spiky? Yeah. So this is the Hollingsworth Swing Bridge, uh, named after James Hollingsworth, civil engineer at the time. He didn't actually say whether he actually had a hand in building the canal, but you'd assume so, wouldn't you? Yeah, 
Well, it's, it's named after him, isn't it? But he was a prominent engineer on some big canals in uh, Scotland. So perhaps he then moved down south and uh, worked. James Hollingsworth was the resident engineer. There we go, so problem solved. Yep. Right, so this is a swing bridge. <laughs> it was largely left open so the, the flow of boats could go through without any, any uh, issue. Yep, the only time it was closed really was when a farmer wanted access across the other side. Okay, and there's some funky flint walls around here as well. And I wonder if that was a sort of led up to the swing bridge edge just over there. Could be. There is the Stuart Bridge. It's another swing bridge. There's one of maybe seven, seven swing says, bridges. Yeah. Now, everything on there that you see is red is from the Hollingsworth Bridge where we were just at. Yep. The black base there is the only surviving part from that actual bridge. So they've kind of reconstructed a bridge as much as they can using the various different parts. Now, the, all the brick there, again, all the brick uh, of the, through of the cut of the canal was buried until 2002. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's been a little bit of work here and there are groups and fractions of people along here that want to restore this as was often the case because it's your local history but to date this is the first bit here point there the first bit of proper cut that we've seen today on the whole of the canal so this canal, the Portsmouth and Arundel Canal, was another scheme dreamt up by Lord Egremont, who was the majority shareholder. And he had this notion that, of course, because of the Napoleonic Wars and the dangers in the English Channel, that this canal was set to help and make a shortcut into London, basically from Portsmouth across inland, across to Arundel, and then join up with the Way in Arran, which again he was part of in terms of the original scheme. But of course, the Napoleonic Wars finished thereafter, and almost as soon as this was built, it became pointless, it became abandoned after I think 1847-ish and the, the idea of the network of the canals again around the south of England was once again put on a back burner. One of the things we'd wondered is how the railway interacted with the canal. But of course, this Bogner branch line, I think was built 1860s, at which point, uh, 20 years previous, the canal had pretty much gone out of use. And so it doesn't interact with it at all. It just piled its way straight through it. And in fact, I think if you look down here, so you've got the railway there, if you look down here, you've got what is probably the bed of the canal. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure this stretch here um, is the canal and there's the railway so the railway just went straight through it so that does show that by 1860 there was definitely no use to this canal. So we've just taken a detour off of the Portsmouth and Arundel Canal and we're now on the Chichester Shipping Canal. Now Chichester had wanted for a very long time a, a water route inland and I think in 1585 there was an Act of Parliament passed which allowed them to make a cut from sea inland. It never happened for some reason but it took the building of the Portsmouth and Arundel Canal for the Chichester Shipping Canal to take place ironically. In about 1822-ish they built this junction off of the Portsmouth and Arundel Canal. So anyway enough of the Chichester Shipping Canal, let's get back on towards uh, the South Sea Tramway because that's where the interesting story comes in about the whole train situation. The South Sea Tram Bridge was built with the line down to South Sea on the West Sussex Railway. Built in 1897, the canal proved a significant issue for the building of the line. As the bridge wasn't built initially, they still needed to get the loco over the canal to help build the rest of the line. But with no bridge here yet, they had to take the loco by road. And they did that by putting rails on their side, balancing the loco on top and moving piece by piece by piece. So we're at the end of today's journey, we are at East Head Nature Reserve, uh, right by the dunes. It's very beautiful, very picturesque. Now, this would have marked the almost the western end of your journey uh, from the canal had you gone from east to west like us. 
however you would have had to navigate some inland channels had you wanted to keep to the whole premise of this canal which was to keep you inland away from the treacherous English Channel you'd have had to go up around the top of Hailing Island uh, through Langstone Harbour and then come back down south towards Portsmouth certainly that was the idea you'd be navigating these inland estuaries so I guess that would be quite a tidal decision uh, on your freight journey So I hope you enjoyed today's video, the Portsmouth and Arundel Canal, the second of our journeys along Lord Egremont's vision that if you wanted to stay safe, you have to get out of the English Channel and get in through his wonderful canal visions. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the end of Napoleonic Wars meant that that was not really uh, a long-term plan, should we call it. And once again, the canal network in the south had pretty much failed by the mid-1800s. Um, all the usual good stuff, like, subscribe and comment below if you've enjoyed our videos. We'd love for you to stick around. We'll see you next week.